excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I just want to let you know that this is a raw, unfiltered, unapologetic conversation. This is a safe space. We are amongst uh, one another, each other. Um, and so uh, I'm going to ask you to to uh, let's just knock it out the park. Let's uh, let's let's drop our shoulders. I'm going to drop our. Let's take that big inhale, exhale out and let's kind of just get right to it. Um, the 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 first question that I have, and I and I also want to set this up by saying that we know that there is nothing new um, that you all probably hadn't dealt with with around education. So I do want to tell you that um, we're going to handle this conversation with strong, strongly taking in the um, the uh, from from the lenses of the past twelve to sixteen to eighteen months. All right. So with that being said, I want to uh, jump right in and ask you all, what do you believe is still the biggest issue impacting schools in the black community? Still the biggest issue impacting schools. And Dr. Perry, um, I want to just go ahead and start with you. Good evening, folks. It's an honor to join you this evening. <clears throat> Excuse me, from wherever you are, I'm here in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The biggest issue remains the belief gap. Uh, the belief that our children have the capacity to be 10 feet tall and bulletproof, the capacity that our children can learn to read, write, and compute on what's believed to be grade level, the belief that um, that our families care about education and it's the reason why they engage in it in the way that they do, and the belief that our children are as talented, if not more so, than any other group of kids. What we struggle is not around how much money is or isn't spent, entirely the real issue is that too many people who have the privilege of being in front of our children genuinely don't believe that our kids can learn what it is that it is, that they're being paid to teach them and that is the challenge that i confront every day at work trying to convince grown people some of whom look just like us that this child is as capable as you are and if they made it to school or in this case if they maybe turn their computer on given the circumstances they're under they need some bad little dudes and you got to really see the power in, in their presence. You got to be impressed with that. And if that doesn't sell you on it, I don't know what it is. The belief gap ultimately is I don't understand how people could spend more than 15 minutes with our children and not fall madly in love with them. Like I got to do everything. I turn myself inside out for you. So it's a belief gap. Belief. Yeah. Awesome. Does anybody else have any experience around this, this idea, this concept of the belief gap? Hi, um, I'm going to push on what Dr. Perry said. I'm going to add the achievement gap and the achievement gap as well. I think we need to acknowledge that these gaps exist because there are a lot of people who disregard the fact. And then we need to start taking those steps to dismantle those systems in place that allow these gaps to exist. And then we can start to reimagine education because right now the state of education is in trouble. What I would really say is, is trash. If white kids were failing at the rate that black students are, we would have reimagined this a long time ago. But because it's black kids, we disregard the fact that the system is broken. Our children are suffering. Our teachers are devalued. We're existing in this, this culture of white supremacy every single day. And then our schools are just performing performative activism. We got the hashtags, the posts, but no one's making any changes. If I can add uh, to both of what you were saying, I think what hasn't changed in the last 18 months and seemingly the last 60 to 70 years, right, since the Board of Education enacted that uh, segregated schools was illegal, right? Uh, segregation is still equally as bad. And most of the places that we think it shouldn't be, uh, majority of the most segregated school districts in our country exist in the Northeast and New York being at the top of that list and Illinois being second, Maryland being third and me being in New Jersey, right? We're fifth on the list. So we, we think of these to be progressive states who we're doing things that are actually moving our students forward. And we're finding that even with the, we're still in a situation where we aren't able to matriculate to the places we need to get the right resources. And in other instances, when we have lowly populated schools, 
they're finding themselves actually wanting to close those buildings down for fiscal responsibility as opposed to leaving them open and providing more resources and smaller classes to uh, specific students to get what they need. Yeah. So what, what I'm hearing is this, uh, this, this overarching theme around the systems, um, around the belief, belief of people in the system, both internally and externally. And then, of course, uh, and then there's this idea of segregation. And Tamika, I want to ask you, um, are, are there any other external factors that like really stand out to you um, that may not fall on the educational landscape, but has a direct correlation in terms of how schools are managed or issues that are uh, imposed on schools? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me uh, to be on this in the discussion. And I mean, I'm on with some incredible folks that know way more than me about the education space. Um, you know, I think about Dr. Perry. Um, I consider him to be someone that should be at the top of the list for uh, the Secretary of Education, right? And so I think, you know, when you ask the question about the external factors, the question comes in, if we're going to invest in public education, in if we're going to invest specifically in public education, and we understand that young black boys particularly are falling behind and have fallen behind, will we invest in black men having the ability to influence our education system from the highest levels of the federal government? And I think that issue stands across the board when looking at all the different departments within the federal government. We say that we want to do better by um, our own. We say that we want to have plans that specifically address the needs of the African-American community. Um, but then we put white folks in charge of all of the major areas um, that actually impact our lives or, you know, we, we as black people become the deputy, the second in charge and not necessarily the ones actually running those areas. When I think about this administration, which, you know, I want to say for the record, I'm excited and hoping to see some real great things happen um, and, and certainly will be a part of the uh, group of us who will be challenging the administration all along the way, even if we have to fight our own people sometimes. Um, you know, to be able to stand up for what we believe is right. But I am excited about it. But when I think about the black man that is in a position, a strong position of power, it ha happens to be defense, right? So we've already chosen to put a black man over uh, war um, and, you know, and safety. And, and, and in a way, it kind of, um, and Dr. Perry, you can correct me if you think that I'm, I'm wrong on this, but it sort of lends itself to the narrative that we're best in places, in positions of, you know, sort of physical threat or, um, you know, a threat to the nation. It's like it's like a, a constant narrative around black people and black men specifically needing to be in law enforcement versus in things like education and health and other important places. And so, you know, I just hope to see that the choices that are made and, and you know, um, and, and we're looking not so much, especially in education for it to be the bougie black man. Although I have many bougie black friends and I'm a little bougie at times myself. So I'm not, you know, trying to uh, speak down upon that group of folks, but we want somebody that's actually touched and felt the hood, right? Somebody who's been there, worked with and understands the needs of young kids who are growing up in, in some real serious conditions or under some really serious conditions. So, but again, I love my bougies. I'm just saying that in, in, in this moment, since we're trying to be radical, we could probably do something that's different from what we've seen in the past. Okay, I'm gonna if kick it over to you. Yeah. If I could add to what Sister uh, Tamika said, um, let's let's talk about the criminalization of black bodies from five years old. Let's just take a quick tour. So, black people make up, black children make up approximately eighteen percent of all kindergartners. Yet they make up forty eight percent of all out of school suspensions for kindergartners. That's five year olds out of school. We make up forty eight percent of all out of school suspensions for uh, children, despite making up only eighteen percent. We know that children who are suspended earliest are suspended most often. Those who are suspended most often are African-American boys. Those African-American boys 
don't gain access to what is being taught in the class during those earliest years. Those people most likely to teach them are white women. We know that in states like Connecticut, only 4% of all teachers are black and less than 40% of them are male. So take that one step further. If a child doesn't read at grade level, by the time they are in the third grade, they have a 75% chance of never reading at grade level in their life. Go all the way through. If you were to go to those young people who are in prison, 75% of them are what we refer to as functionally illiterate, which means they couldn't read a Yahoo article and tell you essentially what it was about. So take that one step even further. 48% of the criminal, 48% of those people incarcerated, despite being about 20% of the American population, are black. We talk about this notion of how it happens. The criminalization of the black body begins at the earliest of stages. And one of the best ways to make sure black people chill out and don't get up and rise up and do what we need to do is to hire white by proxy. These are people who are of color, but not for color. These are people who have the surname of Latinos and, and, and Africans and who look the part, but in a very real way, don't do what they're supposed to do. Mr. Uh, Cardona, who is Dr. Cardona, who's leaving the state of Connecticut to now become the uh, Secretary of Education. This summer, we were trying to negotiate with this brother. The NAACP and I were working to get him to move clearly barriers of the praxis exam and other things that make it harder for black people to become teachers. Ask him, just remove it. You remove it and we can get you more black men to be teachers, more, bl more black women to be teachers. He never finished it. He could have just snapped his fingers and made it happen. It was within his reach. So white by proxy, he's going to carry the water of the white women who are the same people who were locking up black boys from the time they were in kindergarten. If you don't want to have the truth, then find somebody who's going to lie to you. But we know that our children are under siege. They're literally right. under attack from the time they're five years old. The cherub cheek little boy is seen as a as a venerable threat to a grown person. Hey, you, so first of all, you know you just took off, and I and I, I, I want to give everybody else the chance to take off too. You you cover so much. You know, the, the troubling part about those five year olds, uh, you know, being suspended and expelled and more often than not, it's, it's because of non punitive actions. Um, and so I'm here in Nashville. And so we, we actually have advocated to all the way up to the Board of Education um, on reducing the amounts of expulsions and suspensions of black and brown boys and girls for non punitive. So, I mean, I think that is one of the ways that you kind of start to mitigate this whole prison to pipeline. Uh, piece. Um, there's a lot that's, that's been tossed out because I heard Secretary of State, the Biden, the, the school to prison pipeline. Um, I want to I want to touch as much as we can. Um, I want to get uh, Dr. Mills voice in here um, and kind of pivot just a little bit. We'll come back to those topics. Uh, but I want to pivot just a little bit because of when we talk about the state of black education, um we know that education does not happen in silos just like you all have spoken about and so my question then becomes um because of all of the other external factors that do um impact the field of education and when you think about all of the things that that we've been through this year the the countless black bodies that we've seen slayed on social media and across all type of other platforms that there's this question this idea of trauma-informed care and understanding what roles do the schools have in implementing uh, or providing trauma-informed care, and, and not just to the student at this point, but to the, the leadership, uh, to the, the, the support staff, teachers, all the way down to the, to the students. Yep. So in speaking to that, I mean, one of the things that you may have seen floating around uh, social media is uh, where New Jersey stands on trauma-informed care, right? And the Amistad Act being a law that every school within New Jersey is responsible for implementing this, which requires the training of students as well as adults on these kinds of practices, accurate African-American history, black history, not just those that exist in the textbooks that we purchase that kind of glaze over the truth and uh, don't deal with the facts of the matter as we get through the books. Um, the bad news about that is that everyone isn't upholding their end of the bargain. And so depending on who the leader is, who the superintendent is, or what district is actually responsible for doing it, you get a very watered down version of it. So I'm fortunate enough to have 
a plethora of schools within New Jersey that we uplift that. And Dr. Kendi's work is a staple within our curriculum that if you're not anti-racism, meaning that you're against it, then you're for racism. It's not okay for you to just say, you know, I'm neutral, you know, and we educate our teachers on that through and through, as well as our students. We have curriculum that actually embeds weekly lessons within it to address all of the history. And when we talk Jackie Robinson, we're not just talking about him as a baseball player. We talk, we talk about the work he had to do as an army veteran and go against a bunch of people who were going to lock him up only because he wanted to sit down. But no one really talks about that piece of the history. We want our students to know that. We want people to know, the students to know why Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali. So all of these things, the very little intricate pieces, it's not just enough to say, you know, that Martin Luther King had a dream. We need to know what Malcolm X was about, what he stood for, and why people labeled him as a radical. All of these things are important to the essence of what our students are going to embody and grow to be. So again, I applaud New Jersey for saying yes and mandating it. But for leaders out there, for teachers in the audience, it is our responsibility to now make sure that we raise the bar so that other people don't feel like it's okay for them to opt out. I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I forget the young lady's name. She was, I think she was a teacher in Newark. I remember going to Newark to stand with her because she was teaching young kids uh, black history in a way in which you just stated. Um, also, she had her students writing letters to, I think it might have been, um, I don't wanna say, cause I know she had them writing to somebody who's a political prisoner. Um, and you know, she was fired and it was a huge fight, a huge battle in Jersey about this may have been about six years ago. And I remember thinking to myself that one of the big problems that we have is, and, and it's sort of going back to what I was stating before the leadership, right? Because it's like, same thing with the police department. It's like, who's policing the police? Who's training the trainers? Who's teaching the teachers? Um, and who's really doing checks and balances on whether or not these programs that you're speaking about are happening? Not everybody has a Steve Perry in the building. Not everyone has, um, uh, you know, has a, a school or a situation um, set up where the people who are leading are truly invested in the students and in ensuring that students of color um, succeed in the ways in which they should. A lot of times I feel like, um, unfortunately, uh, the public school system and just schools in general in this country are operating just like everything else. They operate just the same way we do with food, um, you know, with criminal justice, of course, the courts, everything. It all operates like you're in a meatpacking space where every it's an assembly line where people are just trying to do enough to get through, package it up and send it out into the world. And there really hasn't been any quality control um, or an investment that is being made where people understand that what you can do with other students is not the same as what you can do with us. And so, it, you know, the question always comes up, what can and I'm over here asking questions because I'm trying to learn at the same time. Um, but what can a teacher do? to instill this type of information and to give these types of instructions, knowing that the leadership in their building doesn't necessarily support it? You know, I, I guess it's a rhetorical question. That's a good question. I want to come to you uh, for that. And, and, and thinking about how can teachers implement these, these, these new concepts without the scrutiny of, of their leadership. Um, I also kind of want you to think about this, that cross sector of of media and education because a lot of teachers um they they're getting sources of information that are no longer conventional and traditional and they are wanting to implement those things in the schools and so i'm curious to see how you have managed this cross sector being a media personality being an educator um and then doing that boldly without thinking about the repercussions that may come from the form any form of leadership yeah, well, I didn't think about the repercussions or I didn't care about them. And so I was fired during the pandemic because of it, because I held leadership accountable, because I called them out 
and I was targeted. I was isolated, targeted, and then pushed out. Um, I've had this conversation and shared this in spaces with other educators. And my question is always the pushback of, do victims typically ask their abuser for therapy after they've been repeatedly tormented? And why am I looking towards the, why would my students look towards the school system for trauma-informed care? The schools are traumatizing them in and outside of the classroom. Like I can't tell you how many PDs and school assemblies I've sat in where they've talked to this, but no one's naming or eliminating the injustices as they're operating in our schools. Because we're not doing what we're saying we're doing. We're just paying lip service to it. I went to a high school in Queens where every single day we had to walk through metal detectors and get searched every day. We had more security guards than counselors. Trauma, that's not by accident. That's the way the system was designed. You know what I mean? Like the schools that I attended, they found various ways to push kids out, out of the classroom, making it difficult to graduate, difficult to get a job, but easy to become a statistic. That's not by accident. The system was made this way. I don't have the answer to your question, Sanika. I was fired for, for trying to do that. I don't have the answer. I don't know if any of my colleagues have the answer. So I guess it is rhetorical. Yeah, I think for me, this kind of leads over into an area of then, based on your response, I posed the question around uh, self-advocacy, because as soon as you started to speak, I felt that boldness, um, that passion behind, you're going to be about what you say, what you say you're about. But then my question becomes, wherever you are on the education spectrum and you understand the challenges that that are in front of you, then how do leaders like you propose that whether you're a parent that you that you learn how to self advocate well, you what's, a, what's a proposal malcolm was a credit Mal yeah. malcolm was credited with saying that if you put your head in the lap of a man who has a noose who's responsible for your hanging and i don't know if he said it but i agree with the supposition which is if you go to the people who are literally profiting off of your demise and expect them to in some way or another grant you freedom then you've engaged in a foolish endeavor to me it's simple we have to start our own schools anything short of that will not get us what we need the reason why we start our own schools is because i was about to ask somebody whether or not we could teach uh, uh what we want to teach when we want to teach it I wasn't about to have a conversation with the United Federation of Teachers who in 1968 fought against community rule so much so that Dr. King himself pushed back and said, yo, Al Shanker, can you just stop? All these black people want to do is be able to hire their own people to teach their own children and they want to teach them what they believe to be important. But what you'll find in this book called, when it's a powerful book called The Strike to Change New York, in that book, it talks about how these large, these overwhelmingly white middle class people who were not sending their children to these schools literally took out the chapters on Malcolm X because they found them to be incendiary. So why are we thinking that that group with that DNA has changed their stripes? These are the same people who look at our children as so unworthy that they won't even go to school to work with them. They won't even go. In a place like Chicago, they rather stand out in the cold and send children inside and stand, literally, it's Chicago's freezing right now, than to go inside because they've allowed themselves to internalize this notion of our surly, dirty, infectious children. Meanwhile, 75% of all private schools are in, in play. Meanwhile, colleges and universities are back on campus. Meanwhile, daycare centers are back in play. But urban kids are not being allowed to attend school despite the fact they weren't being taught in the first place. So I'm saying, I gotta, you know, I'll give y'all a very real example. One of my colleagues just sent me a text said, uh, we're about to go back in full time in uh, one of our schools in Harlem. And someone said, hey, you know, you're getting some pushback from some of the folks on staff. Okay, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> we're going back to school. So anybody who likes working with us gets to go back to school because our children have been out for almost 12 months and 96% of them came in below grade level when we got them. So what kind of fool would I be to put them out further knowing that I can see them when I'm on Zoom. I can see them in their room. I can see their brother and I can see their sister 
trying to learn simultaneously. One is doing English. The other one is doing math. They got headphones on. Today, Zoom was atrocious today. I'm in classes in Harlem and in Bronx and in, in Bridgeport, and, and it's like uh, 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 the whole time. I mean, that was all day today. Kids coming on and off camera, even if our teachers taught their butts off today. So the only way for us to be in control is for us to be in control. Anything short of that, anything short of that goes back to the rhetorical question, which is who is responsible for your hanging if you put your head in the lap of a man with a noose? Theory. Uh, I think you're expressing a, a great deal of frustrations, and I am reminded that um, that there are school leaders on this on this uh, this you know watching this conversation, watching this panel, and um, I'm hoping that a fire is lit into them. So I'm going to go off the beacon path really quickly for like a rapid fire round, and I want to ask each one of you your why, your W H Y. Um, because this is the opportunity. Each one of you all, ha you all have platforms and you all have clearly put your stake in the ground and said, this is why I do what I do. Um, and I'm going to continue to do it. This is why we decided to have you on the panel. But I want to give those listeners an opportunity to understand, uh, explicitly understand your why, um, why you do what you do, particularly in the field, um, in the realm of education, or if the education piece uh, has that cross sector with civics and media, like why? I'm starting with you, Dr. Mills. Yeah, I mean, my why is simple. I mean, Frederick Douglass once said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Um, and someone did that for me. Shout out. She wanted to ensure that education was my passport to the future. And it's my why. It's everything about why I do what I do. It was my uh, hard work that had me elevate in a very fast pace. And to Dr. Uh, Perry's point, you know, being in the public school system, having a lot of success and then feeling handicapped that I couldn't grow no more. It was just that I had to open my own schools. And so now having several of them in New Jersey and looking into expand into other facets of, 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 of the country, like is the freedom to work with a board that I've identified that are like minded and understand what it's going to take to educate the students that I actually work with, look like, and most likely have lived where they live in some of the districts that it fills me up to see them be successful, to reach out to me and tell me how great they're doing. And even to help others, right? To let them know that this isn't so complex that you can't do it too. Bianca, you can yeah. do this. Tamika, you can do this. It is a process. It's an application. We can fill it out. And we can push against the politics until we get what we need. So there's resources, there's people out here that are looking to support everyone who wants to do it. And this is the fight that we have in school choice. The sad reality is we're a small percentage of that group, too. So we need to continue to be uh, forward thinking and believe that it is possible for us to have our own schools and our own communities that are offering the appropriate curriculum. So that's essentially my why. And it's why I continue to do this work. To make a come off me. Okay. So my why, you know, I selfishly do my work. A lot of, uh, probably think that my answer would be some wonderful thing like what uh, Dr. Mills just said. It's really not any of that. It really, for me, is my own child. I worry that he could become a statistic like his father. His father was murdered when he was two years old. Uh, he was shot twice and left in a ditch for two weeks. And as I was, you know, thinking of going forward without his dad, I recognized that if I didn't get deeply involved in this work, my son could easily become just like him. Um, and, you know, he still could, but... Uh, you know, God willing, the work that I'm doing is making the world just a little bit better in order for him to have other opportunities. And so it's real selfish for me. When I get up every morning, I see and think about him. Uh, and it's unfortunate because the fact that I'm so invested in trying to, to help along the path of building a, a better world I have actually hurt and harmed him so much because I have not always been present when he needed me just to be his mom. 
Um, and so it makes it, it's, it's so, the balance there is so difficult because I'm so busy worrying about his life from a large context. But the truth is that sometimes he just wanted to watch a movie and I wasn't able to provide that. And now he's 21 years old. He lives in his own house and I'm like a lonely old lady uh, who's sitting here saying, what happened? Where's my best buddy? And he's like, you know, you missed out on those opportunities. But for me, again, my why is very, very selfish. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that when, when, whenever they count, you know, what we and, and who we are as individuals and where our hearts and minds and our work um, was I want someone to be able to say that I tried, that I was a part of the tribe of people who really put the effort into uh, trying to find ways for us uh, to get free, truly free. That's solid. I say to the chest, be selfish um, because, you know, more often than not, I, I find that those selfish approaches end up having a ripple effect that really benefit, uh, benefit communities. And, um, and, leadership more often than not from my perspective is a sacrificial uh it's a sacrificial game um you don't always do it out of your abundance dr paris up to you and Brian, uh bianca we're going to come to you for uh the final while before we jump back into these rounds of the round of questions i want to again thank you for involving me in this conversation i am genuinely humbled uh genuinely humbled um i can't believe i get to wake up as me every day been fortunate that I've had the chance to meet a lot of folks and a lot of them have really cool jobs and they get to drive really nice cars and live in really dope houses and all that stuff. And, and I, I'm, I'm for that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm here for that, but it isn't what motivates me. It, my, my kids are so breathtaking. They are so remarkable to look into their eyes and know that this powerful nation awakens at dawn every day to destroy them, to literally, it, to destroy them from the food that they eat, to the way that they travel, to where they live, to every single thing about them. Sure, I got a backstory. Yes, my father was in prison by the time I was 18 years old. Like, yeah, I got that. So I just kills him, like, whatever, all that. There are people with that backstory who ain't got nothing that doesn't motivate them in the least to do what it is that we do. I am aware, as Sister Tamika was saying, of how many nights I'd missed with my sons. Um, and, and part of my hope is that one day they'll be talking mess about me and how I was absent as often as I have been, and that somebody will remind them that I was part of a day that could have gone miserably wrong um, for them and that they wanted to take a moment to thank them for allowing their father to be part of other children's lives. My sons attend our schools. I wouldn't do it well, when I was in college, but he did attend them. And I've seen children of people like uh, Sister Mika and I uh, who don't walk in our footsteps, who don't take up the mantle because they have so much resentment for what has taken us out of their lives. And so knowing that every day, it's a metacognitive experience. I know what I know, but I still have to do it because it's what I believe must be done. And so I do, my why is really our kids, a little girl today, she's not little, you know, she's grown, she's 16 years old, but so um, 17. So she's, she just got an espelment and we jumping up and down and, and I'm like so hyped for her. And she's got pink hair. She got her hair done pink. She got nails longer than her fingers. And she's saying she don't know if she want to go to Spelman, which school she want to go to. You know, she got the, the whole, she got a flash all day. I mean, come on, who wouldn't want to work with them all day? Like, what What would you rather do? Find anyone else who you're going to meet who has, I got black and Latin kids right now on the mountain at a ski slope skiing and snowboarding. She's up there with pink hair, long nails, about to go to Spelman. But come on, why? Why would, who's cooler than that? Who have you met that's cooler than, than she is? And, and she, you know, she don't even know how cool she is. She's just like, you know, and she, she got to make sure I can see her nails while she's talking to me. And she got to take this pink hair, wig, whatever thing she got on her head. 
and and she's got the school uniform on and she's going snowboarding. She's going snowboarding because in our school, black kids can snowboard. They can ski and they can go to college at a rate of 100 percent. As Brother Mills was saying, school choice is a real thing. Why am I going to send my kids to school system that I know ain't got their best interests at heart? That will look at her and her pink hair and these long nails and would never see her as a college student. That's the only thing I see her as. I see her as my neighbor and one day my colleague. I see her as the person who will be telling kids, like, like my colleagues now who, who are former students, how many times have they talked to my sons and my sons come home and said, well, Mr. Green said we need to do such and such. Oh, really? Mr. Green said that. I wonder where Mr. Green heard that from. How many times did I tell Mr. Green that when he was in eighth grade? But I keep that to myself because I get the benefit from that. This is our community. This is our why. This is what we all wake up for. Like, if you yeah. haven't met our kids, this is what it is. Yeah, that's solid. Who wouldn't want to be around that? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing, again, this level of boldness and courageousness. And we got to make sure that we teach our kids to stop acquiescing because we got all the juice. All right. Period. Bianca, let's go. Yeah, I'm not gonna go after uh, Dr. Perry. You could just keep. <laughs> oh no! Come on, we, we need oh, all that flavor. Right. So uh, this this is your why. This is your why. This is uh, your why. Yeah. Nobody cleans up like a sister. Nobody right. nobody throws it down like a sister. So swing yeah. and and take the inauguration. Y'all yeah, saw the inauguration. Nobody cleans up like a sister. You guys are amazing, and I, I'm I'm just sitting here and all listening to your whys and fanning out in my own space. My why has changed over time. Uh, I know when I initially came into education, it was on the back of, uh, you know, my mom is an immigrant. My, my parents are immigrants. My father was murdered when I was younger. And my mom, single mom, doing her best. She's been a CNA all my life. And, you know, I'm the child that the village raised. I had people really stepping in when my mom just couldn't because she had work. And so I wanted to be that for someone or for a bunch of kids. I wanted to be the favorite teacher that you think of when someone says that. And I didn't realize that me coming in trying to save broken students was the black savior complex. And I, and I think at the time, I didn't think that that was possible because I'm black, they're black. I'm here, they look like me, these could be my kids. And and in, in reflection, not realizing that they, they taught me so much and the system is broken. Nothing about my students is broken at all. Last night I was in a book club meeting and one of the white principals said, I stand in front of kids all the time and I have to tell them, I used to tell them that they could be whatever they wanna be, not realizing that that's a lie. Cause they could be qualified, they could have the experience, but because of who they are, how they look, where they come from, they may not get that job. They may not have that opportunity. And that broke my heart. Cause I do tell my kids, you could be anything you wanna be. And my reason why today is because I want to make sure that when I tell my kids that I'm not lying to them. So oh, that's solid. Um, as you were as you were speaking, I was just reminded, and I know this, and I know you all know this, but each one of us, we are all stakeholders in this education landscape, and we all represent some, a different subset subgroup of folks that want to engage, that want to make change. Um, with the balance of our time, I'm going to bring Blake Nathan back in here in a second, but I do um, want to get to one other question. When we talk about the state of black education and what it is, we we put some things out there. We, we know that, um, you know, Doc, Dr. Perry, take it upon your own time. Maybe tell us on social media or in the blog somewhere what you what would be a recommendation to Biden's pick for, for secretary of state, because Tamika clearly thinks that you should be right up at the top of the list, as do I. Right. But now I want to know for um, our listening audience, if you can give them from from your perspective, a, a practical way of mo being uh, of mobilizing themselves to impact um, the the educational landscape for a progressive, a progressive um, progressively. Yeah, let me stop there and, and progressive in context of what's progressive to you. OK, not not the general progressive. So I I go back to where we started. It's a belief gap. If, if nothing else, you have to be able to look at our beautiful children and see their beauty. The things that you find annoying, that seventh grade girl who comes in and you go to greet her at the front door and she can barely pierce her lips to say hi. I mean, 
don't take that personally. She's in the seventh grade. Like, what is she going through? You don't know. Like, why does that hurt your feelings like that? Get out your feelings. It's a little girl. Like, for real, she hurt you like that? Who hurt you? Come here, let me talk to you for a second. This is what she does. This is what you signed up for. That boy who who looks like he's mad aggressive and he he's, you know, he's got the world on his shoulders. That boy just wants a hug. He just needs somebody to let him know that he's safe. That he's safe. And and you're not gonna do him dirty. You're gonna be there for him, you're gonna rock with them. And surround them with people who believe in them very practically. I'm a proponent of school choice. That means I support charter schools, I support vouchers, I support anything that's gonna free my people from a failed system. It's not, it's not broken. It's working really well. It's really, really working well. I mean, doing exactly what it was designed to do. Make sure that the uh, not uh, make sure the people from the suburbs can keep their gigs. Their brothers are, are probation officers or police officers or work in, in corrections. So they got the whole thing gone locked. They, they got our whole family in, in, in their care. Uh, you know, it's what it is. So it's not broken. Don't don't ever call it broken. It's really, really, really well designed. The belief gap is one that we have to believe that. This is one of the things that I think we don't often believe in, that people like Dr. Mills can have his own schools. Like, like we have to have him work for a school system in order for him to be able to have a school, a school system that is designed to make sure that people like him don't get jobs. And if they do get a job, you better watch your mouth. You better not come in there and, and, and start rabble rousing. I'll share with you really quickly. Uh, our school in Hartford, our first school, uh, U.S. News World Report, top form high school, 100% of our grads started four-year colleges, won multiple state championships in sports and all this stuff, stuff. So you would think in a school that's supposed to be run by people of color, that they first thing they would say is, why don't you open another one? Yeah. I sat in a board meeting where there were only two white people on the board, and a Latin board member said, your school may have a daily attendance of over 95 percent you may send all your kids to college you may be one of the best schools in the country but you will never open another school in this city that's the belief gap that's the belief gap that says that you the other board member said it is too much power for one man for me to open a school who the hell is running around opening schools that's not a rush of people to open schools for the record like there's not a line of people behind me like yo put me in there so I can have I can be cussed out by both the parent and the child the, who I'm trying to save. Mother's coming out and they're saying I'm a, I'll fight you. Okay, sis, I got you. You mad? But let's you going you doing too much. Like who's signing up for that? And you and still you'd rather put us in chains in your system than free us to free ourselves. And so. The belief gap is not just believing in the children themselves, but believing in the black educators to believe that we can and must. The research is really clear. You put one black teacher in one child's life and you increase the probability of that child going to college by 40 percent, 40 percent. If you could increase the, the probability of them going to college by 40 percent by just putting one, what happens if you put two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Like, why do we have to limit that? It's because of this belief gap. Many, I call the white by proxy and I mean it. What you'll see in many cases, the people of color put in charge of whole school systems because those school systems know that those brothers and sisters, they ain't gonna do a damn thing to change it. Not a damn thing. They ain't changing nothing. They ain't changing the curriculum. They ain't changing who works there. They, you could put them in charge of diversity and inclusion and watch and see how few black people they hire. They put them in charge of that, on purpose because they knew they weren't going to change it and they knew that so many of us look up and see a person of color we think oh man i can't fight them i will fight you i don't care what color you are i'll fight you faster you can say jackie robinson you mess around with my kids you got a problem all day all day you have to pack a lunch for this one chief dr perry and that's that's what i'm talking about so we talking about that uh this verse is like this this whole idea around mobility and I wish I had more time to unpack that, but I've been engaging in some deep conversations on LinkedIn. So y'all check me out on LinkedIn and we can keep this going. Um, Bianca, go ahead. Follow Dr. Perry. And, and this this is about mo uh, mobilization. <laughs> you know, whether it's the, the little girl, the, the fireman, how what type of advice would you give them around mobilizing themselves as an individual to impact the educational landscape? When I'm speaking to individuals, parents, friends of parents, colleagues, it's always 
use your voice. I can't tell yeah. you how many times people have just been quiet, but inside they're agreeing. They're nodding. They're sending private messages to that colleague who is standing up. Now that colleague is not only isolated, but they're targeted and they'll be pushed out. So now that kid doesn't have that person there. We need more people to speak up. There's power in numbers. We can't just have Tamika out marching by herself. There has to be people behind to support. I, I got messages. I got emails. I'm still getting emails like, that was great. Thanks for standing up. There's a target on my back. And there's still no change going to happen because I'm problematic. No one's hearing me because I'm always the one speaking up. You can't just have one teacher. You can't just have one parent. We need everybody to speak up. There's a problem. And if it doesn't affect you personally right now, that's also problematic. You're only looking at it from a selfish lens. We don't come together as a community. We need to see how this affects everybody. We just heard Dr. Perry and Ms. Mallory talk about how they're taking away time from their family to work for the community, the bigger picture. We need more people to do that. And until we have that, we want to stay stagnant. Thank you, Ms. Golden. Uh, you, oh, you, you ready to go? Yeah. No, I, I agree. And you know, it feels like being within any type of system like the educational where there are uh, like minds coming together on a regular basis is the is the key place to start organizing, right? And sometimes people, unfortunately, our communities have been beaten down and we've just experienced and are dealing with so much trauma that we're trying to like pick our kid up and go, right? Like just trying to get into the safety of our homes after having been to work where you had to deal with the drama there, you're dealing with the drama at the doctor's office, you're dealing with the drama on the trains, you know, your, your public transportation, you're dealing with the drama on social media, the news, everything is just so much drama. And then when it comes to your kid, that's the one place where you really don't want there to be any drama. But in fact, it seems to me that the educational system, the individuals who are gathered here today, this is a perfect space to organize and figure out how can we be better advocates? Because I think what Bianca's saying is so true, that there are so many um, of us who are advocates, who, who, are, who are quickly considered to just be big mouth whenever we start speaking up. So I deal with it. I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that, you know, I'm going to be one of those people to push the, uh, the Biden administration. But even a few times that I have made statements about some of the things that I see going wrong or, you know, not moving quick enough, I see an onslaught of black people who are like, but he hasn't even been in there five minutes yet. And you're already, you know, trying to challenge him, give him a moment. And then I've had to say oh, a pastor that I know on social media said that yesterday. He said, and I know, you know, how people sub you online where they act like they're not talking about you, but you know, they're talking about you. So he wrote online that um, he, the man hasn't been in there 45 minutes yet. And you guys are, are looking for him to uh, work miracles. And so I wrote back to him. It's interesting, though, that he's already made miracles for other communities, just not ours. And he wrote back to me and said things that make you go, hmm. Now, at this point, no one is seeing the follow up comments between he and I talking. Right. Because they've already read the post, agreed with it to the tune of like hundreds of people are like, yeah, that's right. Give him some time. He's doing things. And they're going on about their lives, believing that those of us who are actually speaking up and saying things like, well, it's contracts with private prisons, but most of our people are locked up in state prisons that the conditions within those facilities are killing them, right? And so you say that, people go, well, but he's doing something. And so I think that Bianca's point is so important here that we have to find a way to be better allies to ourselves and to find spaces like, like this type of system education, whether it be in the church, all of these places 
peoplemeet.com to get together and figure out how to undergird those individuals who are speaking out like Dr. Mills, Dr. Perry, all of us who are speaking out, how do we become a better support system to hold those individuals up? I think that's, that's where, for me, organizing in this space is actually more simple to go out and get people from the street to come to a place where there's no like mind information being shared. That's excellent. Dr. Mills, it's on you. We're talking about how do you how do you mobilize people? <laughs> and so uh, I started an administration really young. I was 25 when I got my chairperson job and I was extremely upset at one of my teachers who was a union rep and the principal expressed to me that the pen is mightier than the sword. And so what I took that to mean is that you get you have more power in the words, in the documents, the things that are concrete that we pull together. And I think when we speak about progressive mobilization, we have to bring it from now that we have your attention to hear our, our ask. We are clear, we are concise, we know what we want. The more of that we can possibly have the greater power we will have. I think that's from the local teacher inside the classroom who has documented what has transpired and is able to turn that over to an attorney is going to ultimately yield more power than them going to the board meeting and speaking out. I think that when we say, what are we gonna do for the black community and how do we want to you know, eradicate the inequity that we experience in this country, it's gonna take us actually putting documents together and say, we want reparations and we want it in this way. We want to eliminate all of the student debt and we want to do it for this long because we have a clearer picture to how it's going to ultimately impact us generations from now. You know, uh, law and policy has been the, the terrorist in this country. It has consistently been the thing that people have voted on and enacted and that we don't even know that it's happening, but it is, right? So you don't need to to say that I'm going to separate you because a municipality is going to have a planning and zoning board that's gonna do it anyway. They're gonna say, put the schools over here, put the liquor store right there, put the church next to it, and put the other things over there where the students can uh, experience and migrate uh, poor neighborhoods and continue the cycle that we set it up to be. So if you're taking anything from me, I would say definitely begin to put things on paper. You want to open a school? Every state, most states has an application process. Take it, draft up a high quality application, submit it and, and push through the politics to get your approval. You have an ask that you need to make to a city, to a county, to a municipality. You want to build on some land. You want to get something accomplished. You have to be comfortable with writing it down. And I think that in order to do that, we got to step back and understand that we have to build the children up to be able to articulate themselves, not only orally, right, but in written English language that are going to take them to the next phase to get the grants, right, to be able to get the, the loan or even get the right people on their team so that they, too, can play the game that's being played against them. Listen, I, I thank each and every one of you. Uh, I've given up the balance of my time to make sure that you all got a full uh, expression. So, um, sincere gratitude, um, Dr. Perry. Is, I'm, I'm great. To, it's great to see that you're still in this. Uh, Blake, come on down here. We, we Blake is upstairs. He's waiting to come down and thank you all. And so we we just gonna get right to it because we don't have much time left. But while Blake is making his way downstairs. Um, 2010 you came and spoke to your tsu and i was a part of that sga crew that picked you up from the airport and drove you around all day man and uh we still we still eating off the off the fruit of that um that type of impact so thank each and every one of you all for the type of sacrifices that you're making it's over come on Blake. come on oh man we can go for this conversation all day i can clearly see um i definitely want to thank dr perry dr jamar mills Ms. Tamika Mallory and also Bianca Gota for joining the State of Black Education panel discussion. Uh, for our viewers, our listeners, I am Blake Nathan, the CEO and founder of the Educate Me Foundation. Um, our mission is to diversify the national teacher population by recruiting and retaining more black teachers. Um, this is our first HBCU Teachers Fair inaugural fair. 
Uh, we had over 800 attendees throughout the day joined our uh, join our workshops, our sessions, our panel discussions. Um, over 70 school districts across the nation, all the way from LA to New York, down to Texas, to Florida, the Midwest, and the South. And so, um, dope event. And we wanted to cap it off with this because, as I was talking to Bianca and Jamar and Dr. Perry's people and Ms. Malley's people, we wanted this conversation to be unfiltered, unapologetically. Um, us for us by us from us, you know, because a lot of times our information that we share is gets filtered through a different system or different channel, and it's not it's not the words that come directly out of our mouth. So um, I'm humbly thankful and honored to have this opportunity to share this platform with you all. To again to be thought leaders in our community that we all look up to and admire, um, and we definitely want to appreciate you guys for taking time to you guys' busy schedule. I know Ms. Mallory got a book just coming out soon, so I know you want. You're doing a lot of stuff and you got two school leaders that are, I mean, in the middle of a pandemic, you know, running great high level schools and Bianca, I mean, educators right now are getting burnt out. So, I mean, all four of you individuals that decide to take off time on your Wednesday afternoon where you can be with your families, still doing things with your schools um, is definitely not taken for granted. So I definitely want to appreciate everybody. Um, again, our attendees, thank you guys. Our sponsors, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for tuning in to State of Black Education. Uh, make sure you follow us on Educate Me Foundation on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn. Um, also, we just created a HBCU Educators page to continue to share the excellence and relevance of HBCU educators across the nation. So um, that's it. That's wrapping up for today. Uh, great day. So thank you.